Take our book and turn to number 324. Number 324. <clears throat> I'm pressing on the upward way. you to turn to with me in your Bibles to uh, Proverbs the 27th chapter and the 27th verse 27 21 <clears throat> a Sunday or two ago uh, a guy came out the door of the church and said I sure would like to hear some sermons from Proverbs, the book of, Pro book of Proverbs. And I'm going to use for uh, 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 all along, use a proverb from this, Bible, this book here uh, to preach to you. I, when I surrendered to preach, I was 15 years old. When I preached my first sermon, I was 15 years old. But it didn't last very long. It was, uh, it was uh, about, about seven or ten minutes long. I don't know how long it was. But it wasn't long because my, my knees wouldn't stop, wouldn't stop shifting and shaking and all that kind of thing. When I got home that day from, when I surrendered my life to preach, and I got home that day. My mother said, Jimmy, I want you to do something that will help you the rest of your life. I said, what's that, Mama? And she said, I want you to read the book of Proverbs. When you come in from after you get through eating your lunch and you go out like your daddy does and you lie down on the front porch a little while, catch your breath before you go back to the field, take your Bible with you, 
and read Proverbs. I did. I've been reading it once a year for a long time, a long time. And I find in it so many jewels that if I could appropriate them, I would be able to understand how to live life with other people and how to live life with a, a life of, of relationship with the good Lord who created us, who made us and put impulses in our minds and our hearts that we could use for his glory and his good. And we've corrupted those things. And when we've corrupt those things, we get our, find ourselves getting into trouble morally, legally, in every which way. I hope that these proverbs that I'm going to be using, and I'll not use all of them, I'll not use them all, but I hope that these proverbs that I've been using will be meaningful to you and meaningful enough that it can change your behavior. This proverb that I'm going to read today is a test. And I want you to look at it, if you will. Not long. As the fining pot, that should be, it would be translated in our language today instead of the 1611 English as refining instead of fining. As the fining pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so is a man to his praise. And you look at that and you scratch your head, right? You scratch your head. What has this got to do about and what is this? Why did this idiot choose this worse, this passage of scripture? Well, I want to tell you why. Tests have a way of revealing what we are made of. I found that out and you found that out in school. When you took a test, the teacher knew what you were made of. The teacher was able to assess what his teaching ought to be from that point. You can take this principle and apply it to anything in life that you want to. What I want to apply it to today is this. They have a way of manifesting our true character of who we are, who, who we are. Often, often when we think about testing, we think about testing through the, through the crucible of suffering. Suffering comes into the life of everybody. Last two days, I've been with, at funerals. I've been doing funerals. And two families became tested in a great way because they were at the final adjustment in their lives, in their relationship with the person that was put into the ground. That's what we think of when we think of testing. But there's more to it than that. There's more to it. I want to ask you this question. What has testing got to do with praise? Well, praise is a way of testing. You want me to explain that? I'm going to explain it in a general sense. I've started to call names, but in a general sense, compliment a woman on the dress she's wearing. And what will be the reply? You want to know? This old thing? Or, I've had this in my closet for 50 years. Isn't that right? Sure, it's right. Thank you would be a good response, wouldn't it? How do you handle praise? How do you handle it? That's what this is about. The writer of Proverbs reminds us that we are also tested by praise. And this 
proverb. This fascinating phrase can be understood in two ways. And I want you to look at those two ways. The first way is that we are tested by praise that is given to us. You know, I stood, <laughs> I stood at the cemetery at the grave last yesterday, and Dudley Cook began to say some things about me, and and my automatically my head just goes down like this. I, I, I just can't, it's hard for me to take praise. It's hard for me to do that. But then I found out he was serious. He took, he stole my uh, closing at the grave that I use most often at the graveside, and he used it before he let me pray. The New American Standard translates this verse like this. We are often tested by praise given to us. That's what it says. And so is a man in his praise given to him. I tried to, I tried to show you what that by showing you how a woman would react to the dress she's wearing and you're praising that. But it applies in so many more ways. Think about this. We're often tested by our praise because sometimes it's insincere. The praise that we give and that we receive. If we believe all the praise that is given to us, it'll lead to false conclusions about who you are and what you're doing and how you need to improve your life. You can do believe it in any way you want to. But the best illustration that I know of comes from the Canterbury Tales, which was written in 1380 and comes down today to us in, and, and has very great lessons to teach us. I doubt you've read the Canterbury Tales since you were in high school. I doubt that you have. And I doubt you remember the stories that are in there. But there's a story about a rooster who was called Chanticleer. And Chanticleer loved his crowing. And he would get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and crow as loud as he could. And then if the, if the chickens didn't get up and applaud him by getting up, he would crow again just as loud as he could. And he continued this, this lifestyle. And then he would crow about 6 o'clock so that the farmer would get up and come out and feed him. He loved his crowing. And he strutted about inside the chicken yard, as Spencer found out the other day. He strut, and as, as Richard found out what a rooster will do, he struts about in the chicken yard, and if you get in his way, He'll remind you that he can crow. He'll run you. He'll chase you. And he'll get in your way. Chanticleer was just like that. And one day, a fox came to the chicken yard. And, the, and Chanticleer jumped upon, a, jumped upon a, the, the top of the fence. And he crowed as loud as he could because, to 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 alarm the chickens so they could hide. And the fox looked up and he said, Chanticleer, you can, you can crow much more beautifully if you get down on the ground where your feet will be solid. And he kept on with that, that, with that, feet, with that, that, that idea. And he said it again. And he said it again. And Chanticleer began to say, do you think I can crow? Began to think inside, do you think I can crow as well, be, uh, better on the ground? I want to show you what I can do. And he jumps to the ground and never crows again because the fox could kill him. Now guess what that story is saying? 
he's saying, so is the man to his praise if he believes every word that has been said to him. Do you see? Do you see? But sometimes we must realize that this praise that is given to us is temporary also. Praise can quickly turn into criticism. <laughs> How many is the preacher who stands at the door of the church and shakes the hand of his con congregants as they go by? And that, as he stands there and shakes the hand, good job, preacher. You told them today if they'd have just been here, you were doing a good job in your preaching. Now believe that because it's sincere as they go out the door. And then meet that person on the street and he'll ask you, what's happening to our congregation? Do you know? Why are they staying at home like they are? Do you know? And I'm thinking, boy, it's not such a good job after all, is it? It's temporary sometimes when praise comes to us like that. And sometimes that kind of praise that is given to us is undeserved. If we believe it, it'll lead to false understanding of who we are and of our relationship with the Lord. And you say, wait a minute, Jimmy, how can that happen? Well, we'll think we can do or that we have done <clears throat> what we can't do or what hasn't been done. I want you to think about something that happened in Jesus' lifetime to illustrate what I'm talking about. There's a story in Mark about a rich young ruler who comes to Jesus. And that rich young ruler says, Good master, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, Keep the commandments. And he listed, all, he listed the last six commandments. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not uh, kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not... Uh, uh, covet and so on and he lists all of those commandments what does do you remember what the what the uh, uh, reaction of the man was why Lord I have kept these from my youth up I have kept every one of these from my youth up and then Jesus says but you lack one thing Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor and then come follow me. And the Bible says that he turned, the, the, the young man did, he turned and he walked away heavy of heart because he could not put God first in his life. He had come to the point that he believed everything that Jesus said except the last verse. Believed it. Think about that. Have you ever thought that maybe that's the reason that God put the Ten Commandments in the negative? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not take unto thee any, make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Thou shalt, <clears throat> thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not have false witness, bear, bear false witness, and so on. Thou shalt not. He may have put it in that faction because he knows that we are subject to do any one of those things in our lives. Praise may be undeserved. And then let's look at the second way 
that this praise comes. I want to read the verse again, so you might want to, might want to follow along. Be thou, oh, 21, as the fanning pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so is a man to his praise. We can be tested by that praise that is given to us from somebody else. Or we can be tested, and this could mean that, by the praise that we give to other people. It's translated like that by a translator. I told you in the first test, the first one, that the New American Standard translated that word that is given for praise as praise given to us. But the Amplified Bible translates it this way, for a man is judged by what he praises. A man is judged by what he praises. You say, Jimmy, what's the difference? The difference is this. A person's value and worth is determined by what he believes to be of value and of worth. And what we praise reveals the kind of person that we are. It's very easy to see a drunk praise another drunk. Now I'm going to tell you, it happens, doesn't it? If it doesn't, you haven't watched any of the, any of the cowboy shows on television because you have one drunk praising another drunk for drinking as much as he can get drunk. All you want to see. But he praises that man for being drunk. I want to think, I want you to think about this in that way. What we praise reveals the kind of person that we are. And what is important to us will reveal and show to other people the kind of person that we are. The gold and the silver are put into pots. They are boiled and boiled and boiled and boiled till all the bad comes to the top. And that bad is skimmed off. And what is left is what the refiner needs what he wants. I looked at uh, many things to try to find an example of what he was talking about here. And I remembered an illustration that I had come across way back in the eight, in the 80s. There was a there was a representative whose name was Dan Daniels who came from Virginia and represented Virginia in Congress. And Dan Daniels was to be the speaker that day at the prayer service. You do know, don't you, that there is a National Day of Prayer and that there is a prayer service that is held in Congress on that day. I pretty have a pretty hard, hard time now that they are praying to uh, the God of the Jews, the God of, the, of uh, the Muslims, and whatever. But the God that we serve is the God that Dan Daniels was praying to. And Dan Daniels said this, and I'm going to have to read it to you. I hope you'll let me. One of the insidious dangers that constantly threatened the American people is that we shall give all of our time and resources to building a wall around the free world, forget the moral foundation of life, and thus be defeated from within. Now I want you to listen to what he says in the 80s, 1980s, and I want you to compare it to what's today. The Great Wall of China, he says, was a massive structure, and when it was completed, it gave the outward appearance of having maximum security. 
Yet within a short time of its building, it was breached three times. Three times by the enemy. Not by direct assault, but by bribing the gatekeeper. The collapse of the wall did not imperil the country, but a failure in character brought about its downfall. Think about your country today. Think about where you live today. It's not what climbed over the wall that destroyed China. It was because there were no people there that was, were trustworthy. Three people who could be bribed. But now listen as Daniel carries on, and he says this. On the other hand, the 4th century B.C. Greece, the ruler was asked why of all the city-states of Greece, Sparta alone had erected no walls, not any, no walls. He turned to a group of young men, the man who was asked, turned to the, a group of young men, and he said, Sir, there are the walls of Sparta, and every man is a brick. How do you handle the praise that comes to you? How do you give praise that would build up and not tear down? You see, we recognize the imperative of the maximum physical strength that belongs to the wor uh, that we see in the world. But yet we must see, so Daniel said anew, that the ultimate security and all that we cherish and hold dear lies in this moral fiber, the spiritual and dynamic strength of our people. I listened and read that to you so that you can know that we still live in a time when we don't need a wall around our country. We need men and women who can be the bricks in that wall of security. Now, what am I talking about? Let me give you an example. I have never seen a gun that went off by itself. I have seen a gun in the hands of my brother Tommy be deadly to rabbits and squirrels and birds. I have seen him kill snakes. In fact, he did so at the Warrior Creek about a year ago. I've seen that. But that gun did not discharge a bullet until there was a finger that pulled the trigger. I want you to think about our country and think about who we are. We live in the greatest country in the world, praise. We live in the freest country in the world, freedom. We live in the best country in the world. Everybody wants to come to it. Everybody wants to be an American. Why? It's praise. May America and may we live up to the praise that is given to us by the world, by other people. Would you bow your heads with me now for prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we find a challenge in your word for us to be good people. Stated in the words of Solomon that we are like the silver and the gold that is being tried in the furnace. 
and we are tried by our faith. May our faith and may our, may our faith be great enough to withstand any temptation that is sent to it. And may we, like Sparta, be able to defend our country when we need to. To defend the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ in the, school, in the classroom, in the workplace, at home so that when we come together in church, we can speak with our master with honesty in our voice. Thank you so much for giving to us our Lord Jesus to be our Savior. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.